<laughs> Hello, folks, and welcome back. And I feel like I've probably saved the best for last year. <laughs> At least that's my favorite, uh, my favorite thing. I, I just love this topic. The rhetoric of video games. It kind of combines my two favorite things. I love rhetoric. I love uh, video games. Written lots of books on it. Interviewed probably a million or so uh, developers at this point. I'm uh, actually not not to brag, not to toot my own horn too much, but I'm you know, kind of recognized in in this field. Even uh, done a feature film and will soon be on the History Channel. I'm talking about video games. <laughs> Exciting uh, uh, things. And it's, uh, you know, I remember when I was first started thinking about being a professor of uh, English and wanting to study video games, I, I caught a lot of flack. And a lot of people poo-pooed the idea. You know, they said, you're ne never going to get anywhere with that. <laughs> you know, good luck. Good luck finding a job. You know, that, that sort of talk. Uh, and yet here I am and, uh, you know, did fine. Uh, so let, just let that be a lesson to you. If you want to study something and you're passionate about it and you hear people saying that's not worthy of study or that's, you know, uh, that's insignificant or, you know, whatever, you should study something more serious, uh, you can uh, just think about your old uh, Professor Barton, you know, and it worked out pretty well for him, uh, just stay, staying true to your vision. You know, I was, you know, Bogos talks a little bit about this in the, uh, this article that I had you uh, read for today. Uh, but, uh, you know, I always think about things like Shakespeare. You know, most people nowadays consider uh, Shakespeare great literature, you know, quite rightfully so. It's a magnificent, you know, unquestionably, uh, uh, you know, the best, <laughs> some of the best words written in the English language, period. Uh, and yet, if you go back and look at the academics back when Shakespeare was, you know, writing those plays, they were like, oh, this is, you know, this is just trash, popular garbage for the masses you know it's not even in latin for god's sake it's not even in latin uh, anyway uh, enough of that soapbox uh what are we talking about here today other than yours truly uh we will get into bogost ian bogost who uh you know another uh, long-haired scholar I just throw that little detail out there <laughs> maybe there's a uh, maybe you need long hair for, uh, for game studies i don't know uh, anyway, uh, he's got this concept of procedural rhetoric. It's one of my, I don't like the name of it, but uh, it's a really great concept. And we've been talking here about visual rhetoric and uh, media perspectives and, 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 and uh, feminism perspectives and, and Kenneth Burke. You know, there's all these different perspectives we've been talking about. I think procedural rhetoric is the final one. Uh, so I, I always put this out there along with uh, Scott McCloud and his, what I call a comics perspective. Uh, you know, this is perfect. If you wanted to write a paper using uh, procedural rhetoric and applying that as a concept to a video game or another kind of, doesn't have to be a video game, uh, you can do that. And it's, it's very useful. Uh, yeah, so I jumped ahead to number two there. But <laughs> anyway, those are the objectives. Okay, question one. Uh, so just to get you thinking about this topic, think of some of the games you may have played over the years. And I realize not everybody in this class considers themselves a gamer. And uh, quite frankly, a lot of people who I do run into that call themselves gamers, uh, you know, it means different things to them. Uh, for some, a lot of people, that means you're into esports. You know, you're playing these uh, massively uh, multiplayer competitive games all the time. <laughs> you get obsessed with that. Uh, and they don't consider people that like other games to be gamers. You know, I'm not going to get into all that nonsense i mean if you wanted to study that by the way that'd be a great thing for the sct symbolic convergence theory fda you know you could study these uh, uh these, these gaming communities with, with something like that uh but here i'm just thinking about any kind of game if you play monopoly uh, monopoly yes if you play monopoly with your family uh or, or clues another one uh something like that or if you want to talk about pokemon go uh, civilization uh, animal crossing like bogos does you can think about a game like that uh, but i just want you to think hard about this or you know oh by the way you can talk about the walking dead game if you uh, of course if you played that one already uh, but think about that game 
try to get beyond like whether it's fun and you know sort of fun funny stories with your family and you know things of that sort just think about that game and how it might have got you thinking about a topic you know taxation or the economy i don't know uh, maybe even the value of logical reasoning deduction you know with case of clue you know something along those lines uh or of course uh, fighting games and competition you know you name it uh, but just some way it might have changed a belief and behavior and attitude you know maybe you haven't really thought about this before you thought it's just a game you know, you know how could it do that it's just a game but really try to think about it and and don't just say you know, you don't play games <laughs> you know everybody everybody plays something uh you know, even if you don't think about yourself as a gamer or that thing that you're doing as a game. Yeah, and just to start us off here, since I mentioned Monopoly, I always love this story. Uh, do you know the story of Monopoly? This might surprise you. The the Who came up with this game? So it was, you probably played it, you know, one of the modern versions, but it actually got started back in 1904. Uh, and it was designed by, let's see, what's her name? Elizabeth, it says Elizabeth Maggie there, but Elizabeth J. Phillips here. I guess there's a couple names for her. But anyway, uh, she created this game specifically to be rhetorical. So you can see here on Wikipedia, <laughs> it started off, it wasn't called Monopoly, it was called The Landlord's Game. It's a board game. It is a realty and taxation game intended to educate, quote unquote, educate, users about Georgism, and then if you read about what Georgism is, uh, a single tax movement, an economic ideology, holding that although people should own the value they produce themselves, you know, it's going crazy, uh, the economic rent derived from land, including from all natural resources, the commons, and urban locations, should belong equally to all members of society. <laughs> so, you could get in like neo-Marxism with some of this stuff, right? But, you know, here's a game that, you know, had this sort of indoctrinating purpose, supposed to, suppose, you know, educate, propagandize, you know, whatever you want to want to call it. And then it uh, became this very popular game of Monopoly. You know, kind of got away from that. I don't know, I guess, the, you know, Maggie had one goal in mind which when she made this game, but it kind of got expanded because I think people were... <laughs> <laughs> uh, either didn't really buy into that message or they just uh, you know, had a different interpretation of it, right? So that, you know, that just goes to show you, to kind of jump ahead here, that just, you know, just because you have a, you know, kind of an agenda with a movie or a game or, or comic, there's no guarantees that your audience <laughs> is going to respond to it the way you might want them to. And that's kind of Bogo's point in here, too, is... Um, and once you start learning about procedural rhetoric and how it works, uh, you might, you know, be able to start resisting some of these messages, or, you know, turning them on on their head, or maybe the, the person designing the game, maybe they don't, if they don't understand procedural rhetoric, well, if they might end up creating a game that actually does the opposite of uh, what they intended. We'll get into some examples of, of that. Okay, but anyway, he talks in here first about this game, Animal Crossing. And I don't know how familiar you are with that. There is a picture of it. Uh, they're kind of this cutesy game. It was pretty popular a few years ago. I don't know what it's about now. It sounds a lot like a game. I haven't played Animal Crossing. I have to admit that. <laughs> uh, I did play uh, a game that it sounds like called Stardew Valley. You know, play that pretty uh, pretty often on Steam. There's another one called My Life in Porsche. I think it's the same sort of sort of concept, but. Uh, anyway, Bogo is, uh, is saying this is a, a little cutesy game, basically, in these little animals. In, uh, his, I think his son is like five, you know, when he wrote this article. <laughs> so he's, you know, he's doing what we all should do is learn from learn from children. You know, when you, when you see kids doing things, and if you really listen to what they're saying, and you know, almost like a almost like a scientific view of your of your own kids, like you're doing research, uh, you can learn things, uh, like Bogo does here. So he's just watching his his kid play this game, and he's listening to the yeah, I guess his, his son talk about the game with him. And he says he begins to realize, or he says the son, his son began to realize the dilemma facing him in this game. Uh, the more material possessions he took on, 
the more space he needed and the more debt he had to assume to provide that space. And the additional space just fueled more material acquisitions continuing that, that loop. Uh, so that's a pretty sophisticated uh, realization for a kid. And to make this connection between you know, the, the buying and then having more space, and now you need more stuff to go in the space. And <laughs> I guess there's a, a landlord or a salesperson, a shop owner, I guess, Tom Nook in this game. And you see uh, Tom Nook getting richer and richer as you're you know, basically working harder and harder to make your, your house nicer. Uh, meanwhile, all these uh, animals are satisfied, I guess, with their fruit. What do you call it? Fruit furniture? <laughs> yeah, they don't seem to be nearly as materialistic, and yet they seem, uh, you know, quite happy. So that's, that's a pretty good example uh, of a game here where it's not preachy. You know, like that landlord's game looked like it was kind of preachy, right? kind of like, kind of on the nose. <laughs> like, here's what you're supposed to think when you play this game. By God, here's the message. Um, you know, who knows if the people designing this Animal Crossing game were even thinking about this stuff. You know, maybe they just kind of put this together thinking it would be fun. Uh, but, but that's besides the point. It's, it's once you get down and start analyzing it rhetorically, thinking about the procedures in this game, uh, then you can make an argument that it's trying to make a case you know, to try to adjust people's attitudes. I guess in this case, maybe make people a little bit more reflective about consumerism, the value of materialism, uh, maybe emphasizing that, hey, what's really valuable here is, is really getting uh, getting along well with your community, uh, spending time with your neighbors, your friends and family. You know, maybe that's more important than owning that new uh, Peloton or whatever the, the hell it is, right? <laughs> that, so that's a, you know, a pretty good example. I like the, the fact that his uh, five-year-old came up with it. <laughs> and that shows you, you don't have to be... Uh, have a PhD in this stuff to be able to figure out how these games, you know, I think manipulate might be a hard, uh, a bit of a harsh way to talk about Animal Crossing, but, uh, you know, it's a good example. One I, I think about a lot, and Bogost has used in other cases, is a, uh, a game called Civilization, or Civ. You know, I probably spent probably about 500 years <laughs> playing that game, feels like. Uh, but in that, uh, let me see if I can get a picture of it here for you. Let's see, what is it, Civilization? I think they're up to six now. Uh, yeah, there it is. Okay, let me, yeah. Uh, so this game, is, it came out... God, I guess, I don't remember, 80s or 90s, the first one? Not quite sure. But one of the interesting things about this game, it's actually very addictive. And I don't I don't usually like that word addictive because it makes it sound like there's something wrong. <laughs> and basically, when you say a game is addictive, you're just saying it's fun to play and you want to spend a lot of time, time with it. It's engrossing. Uh, why that's a bad thing, I, I don't know. I mean, you can get carried away with it, sure. But uh, anyway, uh one of the fun things about this game, or one of the rhetorical things I would say, one of the procedural rhetorics about this game is that uh, to get advanced, you know, to advance your society, to get to the, you know, the, the better buildings, the, you know, harvest resources better, <laughs> ultimately to win, uh, you need to build libraries and schools. Uh, so all these civs, it's, you know, the sooner you can get the library built, and start building some some uh, universities and colleges and you know I think the last one's like primary schools and labs uh, usually do pretty well you know if you don't build those things if you just focus on like troops making your army bigger or just building lots of farms or whatever if you don't have those libraries you, you quickly lose the game at least <laughs> at least I do and so that's kind of if you think about it one of the arguments in this game is like you really should support public libraries you should uh, support public schools, and you shouldn't just uh, put all the money into the military uh, or you know, corporations or whatever, uh, because uh, ultimately that will cost you. <laughs> you know, eventually the other civilizations that do invest in those things will you know surpass you, uh, and even if they're smaller, you know if they're showing up with like uh, you know jets and you're still dealing with a hot air balloon, <laughs> you know, or like barely, uh, you know, driving around like a Model T, uh, and here comes these folks in like, 
you know, Apache helicopters, you're in trouble. Uh, that's just another one. Now, I could go on, and there's, there's so, pretty much any game will have some message like that. <clears throat> okay, let's see what else Bogus has to say here. Yes, we understood in this way we can learn to read games as deliberate expressions of particular perspectives. In other words, video games make claims about the world, yes, which players can understand, evaluate, and deliberate. deliberate. Now, game developers can learn to create games that make deliberate expressions about the world. Players can learn to read and critique these models, deliberating, he likes that word deliberate, doesn't he? <laughs> and deli deliberating the implications of such claims. And teachers can learn to help students address real world issues by playing and critiquing the video games they play. And so on and so forth. Uh, so yes, that Civ game was in fact, or not a Civ, but a, an earlier one called Sim City. And that's a real time game where you're you're basically a, a mayor, I guess, in charge of a city, and you're laying down uh, roads and telephone poles, and <laughs> you know you can, you're kind of uh, you know building uh, the city up into a massive uh, mega city. Uh, so they actually use that game to teach kids about taxes, like a, you don't want to have too heavy of a tax, I suppose, or they'll start to have repercussions. There's like a sweet spot in there where you can, uh, uh, I guess, get the growth just right, and you have enough to support those. The infrastructure and all that sort of thing. Uh, but I remember a story about SimCity that's kind of fun was there was a, I guess, a mayoral election and kind of one of the, um, uh, I guess, one of the gimmicks to get people interested in this was they, they had all the con all the people that were running for that office <laughs> come in and play uh, SimCity. And the idea was whoever was had the best city in their game of SimCity by the end of the time, uh, you know, maybe that would help you decide who to vote for. And uh, come to find out the the guy who did the best ended up <laughs> getting that job. So, I think he probably did okay uh, on the other end, too. But, uh, you know, if you think about what SimCity is, it's a simulation of a city management. And also on this point, too, I will just say, while I'm thinking about it, there is a series of role-playing games where it's called Ultima. It came out in the early, early, uh, when was that? Probably early 80s, late 70s, somewhere in there. I'm pretty sure it was like 82 or 80, 1980. Uh, but anyway, uh, the developer of that series, Richard Garriott, calls himself a, a Lord British. He got, went on to make many, many games, including Ultima Online. Uh, basically created the whole massively multiplayer online thing. World of Warcraft was, was bas basically based on this uh, Ultima Online game that he created. And a lot of the games like Final Fantasy, all that stuff was also based on his Ultima games from you know way back on the Apple II. Uh, but anyway, uh, I remember talking to him, and he's written about this, uh, Garriott, and he said that he was getting letters uh, from parents. You know, so their kids were playing these Ultima games, and they're going around like killing everything. You know, you kill the monsters, you kill the thieves, uh, the rats, you know, whatever. You get experience points, and... Uh, you level up, you get better gear, you get more more gold to spend on things, you know, the classic uh, RPG formula. Uh, so they were kind of uh, worried about this, and they wrote, you know, this lady wrote a uh, Garrett and said, you know, he needs to do something about this. And you're kind of making these kids into, you know, thinking that violence is uh, is okay. <laughs> they're, they're getting very poor ethics from your games, uh, Lord British. Uh, so he took that very seriously, and he uh, bothered him. Because he's a very, you know, social justice kind of guy, right? Very ethical, very concerned. Uh, I think that kind of hit him pretty hard, actually. So he uh, made an Ultima game called, or he, he introduced his virtue system uh, into his games. And this uh, concept of the avatar trying to seek uh, the virtues. Uh, so in the, it, basically what happened was, in those games, you can't just run around doing killing and, and stealing, right? If, if that happens, you lose the game. If you want to win the game, you have to be virtuous and like help people, you know, and basically you know, do the right thing, and you get rewarded. If you do the moralistic thing, uh, you get rewards. Whereas if you're just a, you know, a jerk, <laughs> uh, you have a really hard time and ultimately fail. And so he was very self-conscious about about that system. Studied morals. I mean, he's actually, uh, and I'd like to do a book on him at some point because he's just somebody who's put a lot of thought into like the. Uh, moral implications of people playing uh, his games. He doesn't want 
he, he basically wants the, his games to make you a better person uh, when you play them, or at least get you thinking about ethics and, and morality, and not just uh, you know mindlessly killing everything and such. So there's that. Now let's see. This association of video games with leisure is not a necessary condition. It is rather a byproduct of a misunderstanding of the nature of play. Right, so we went into this with McLeod as well. And there's a lot of snobbishness out there, you know, comics. You study in comics, you know, come on. <laughs> Aren't you a grown person? You know, put, put away that manga, you know, man. Like, please. Uh, I like this stuff. <laughs> Back off. <laughs> uh, the same kind of thing here with these video games, right? Uh, just because, yeah, you got video games that are totally candy for the brain. You know, brain candy. Uh, what's that one that, uh, Candy Crush, you know? <laughs> uh, that sort of thing. Yes, it's fun. It's a way to kind of meditate. You know, I, there's not really a whole lot of uh, story there. I don't know if there's really any story to that. It's a, it's kind of basic, basic stuff. Uh, but that's just like one game. You, you don't want to draw conclusions about the game industry just based on that one example. Or something like Pac-Man. You know, when you've got games like, well, The Walking Dead for this class. I mean, very rich, sophisticated. Uh, in the, my game studies class, English 280, we play a lot of games that are no celebrated, really, for their narrative. And the, the characters in there and the decisions you have to make and the, the impact that, that has on, on the gameplay experience. And, you know, I would put those games up there with uh, any novel or any uh, great work of cinema. You know, these are very sophisticated uh, games, and, and just what they're saying here is, is absolutely spot on. Yes, uh, they're talking here about play. You know, this is another, he doesn't use the word gamification in this article, but there is a movement uh, called gamification where they're, uh, what's her name? Uh, Reality is Broken by Jane McGonigal. She's got some TED Talks about this. Uh, but they try to figure out what makes games so much fun you know, people like to sit down and learn how to play a game, and uh, they get better at it pretty quickly, right? They don't have to study. <laughs> it's pleasurable to do all this sort of virtual work. I think she uses the term blissful productivity. You know, people come to play World of Warcraft, and they do these daily quests every day, and it's it's kind of like work. You know, the same thing with that Stardew Valley game. You know, you got to kind of water all your plants. <laughs> um, but, you know, pe people enjoy There's something enjoyable about it. And uh, McGonagall tries to tap into that, figure out what that is, and then see, can we do something like this at work? You know, so can you take some of these gameplay mechanics, gameplay concepts, and apply them to a, an actual job uh, to try to increase productivity or at least, uh, you know, employee satisfaction and uh, that sort of thing? And it seems to be working out pretty well. Uh, but here he's just talking about these... The, the rules of the game and the, the he calls it the possibility space determined by constraints and yeah, that, that's kind of interesting there uh, and I know a lot of you play Dungeons and Dragons in this class and I would consider that a possibility space you know if you read about the history of Dungeons and Dragons uh, and, and war games because they're based on they kind of evolved out of this war games uh, movement that was before that um, but one of the things they, they tried to do in there these are grown people playing these <laughs> for the most part but uh, the I you know it's you got kids that might play make-believe he's got some examples in there like little kids and they'll say oh you're the you know this square is safe over here you know and so on and so forth but and they just kind of make up rules as they go right or uh, you know if you're trying to recreate this battle this battle during the Napoleonic Wars or something uh, you don't want to just have it, uh, just one person deciding, oh, I win that battle. <laughs> you, know, you need some kind of uh, mechanics in there, uh, rules, basically, so you can't just do anything. Right? you got to play within these these rules, so you say things like, well, you, uh, we figured out that the musket was only accurate for such and such a range, and, you know, we got these pieces on the board, and got a ruler and a tape measure out, and, you know, this is too far. <laughs> And so you only get to roll one die instead of two, and you know they they get kind of statistical with it. And, you know, eventually that becomes uh, you know Dungeons and Dragons is, is based on some of that. So if you play D and D with a group of players that aren't you know just brand new, but uh, 
you know, know the game pretty well. They're, they're constantly having these discussions about the rules. Well, they'll say, you know, out of character, but, you know, can I, is it possible for me to cast this spell, blah, 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 and, and do this thing over there? And, <laughs> you know, the, the game master, the DM, whatever they call that person nowadays, I don't know. I was just calling the dungeon master. Uh, will sometimes say, well, I agree with you, you know, or my, uh, he or she might say, well, let's look at the, the rule book and look that up and, and see what it says. Or they might just say, look, uh, it's not really clear in the rules, so here's my here's my judgment. <laughs> just kind of hand that down. Uh, so all of that is kind of like this, this space of what, what can you do in this game? What is uh, not allowed, you know, especially with something like a fantasy game. Because you've got things like magic, and you say, well, if magic exists, I can just do anything, right? <laughs> I just, ma you just magically make the dragon go away. Uh, no. You know, there's parameters around this. There's certain rules. You can only cast at this spell at, at this level, and, you know, on and on and on and on. But rather than be boring or, like, people, nobody says, I don't like D&D &D because it's got those rules. You know, I'd rather just be able to do whatever I want. <laughs> You know, most people, uh, it might sound good at first, but, you know, you probably wouldn't have much fun with that because it just seemed really arbitrary. You know, you just want the DM to say, oh, well, I guess you win that time. <laughs> oh, you lost that time. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> You're just subject to my whims. No, no, you don't, you don't want that. You won't be able to argue back and say, well, look, here's, uh, you know, here's the rules, you know, and it says I can do this. Okay, let's see what else is in here. Uh, he talks about these possibility spaces here, let's see. In a video game, the possibility space refers to the myriad configurations the player might construct to see the ways the processes inscribed in the system work. Hmm. Yeah, and James Paul G. talks about this as well. So you're playing something like a strategy game or Civ or Animal Crossing, or whatever the case may be. Uh, there's a point where you really don't know what you're doing. You know, you might be looking at that tutorial, playing through that, trying to figure this out. Uh, but you don't really know all, what's, what's all possible to do in this game, right? Or, or how the cause and effects of doing things. So you're almost like a scientist in there exploring it, trying stuff out. Maybe you uh, do exactly what the tutorial tells you to do. Or maybe you just say, ah, oh, screw it, I'm going to try this. <laughs> As you're kind of messing around in there. And uh, eventually you learn how, a lot about how this system works. Uh, from doing that, right? You're kind of exploring the rules, uh, seeing what's possible, seeing if you can be creative. You know, a lot of times you're kind of uh, doing things that maybe even the designers of the game didn't even consider. You know, they call that emergent gameplay. Uh, so a lot of times the, uh, you know, I remember one of the stories I heard from a game developer was a, uh, it was an old war game like with the airplanes or something. And he, he was listening to people talk about his game and they didn't know, they hadn't seen the code of the game or anything like that, uh, but they were giving each other tips. And they, they were saying, yes, just, you know, if you approach the plane from this angle or you approach behind it, you know, and do this, this and that, uh, you'll get an advantage on the attack. And everybody said, oh, yes, that's true. And, of course, this developer's just kind of grinning because there's nothing like that in the code. Uh, you know, it's just not true. <laughs> You know, but it's just kind of, they had, they're kind of being creative and they were kind of creating some of these rules that appeared to them to make sense and uh, maybe just kind of randomly played out that that was the, the case, but they were, uh, you know, doing things that the, <clears throat> even that game developer had no idea. He did not even put that in there. <laughs> All right. Uh, procedurality is the term he wants to use. Procedural rhetoric, and again, it's not, he even admits it himself, not the sexiest word. You know, you kind of wish it would be like game rhetoric or something. Uh, again, this is a problem with a lot of these video game studies people. Uh, you know, I don't tend to like them too much. <laughs> you know, even though I'm, I guess I'm kind of one of them, I don't like this chip on, it's almost like they're dealing with some insecurities, again, going back to the snobbishness and uh, they're always trying to throw around big terms, big words for things. Like instead of just saying games, they want to talk about, you know, ludic. L-U-D-I-C, everything is ludic. Ludology. I'm like, what the hell is ludology? Oh, that, that's game studies. Why don't you just say game studies? Like, what, ludology? <laughs> Where'd you even look that up? <laughs> oh, we can't just say games, you know. Ah, drives me insane. Uh, <clears throat> I kind of lost my, my train of thought. Oh, oh, yeah, procedural rhetoric, though. Um, 
you know, he says in here, it's like visual rhetoric just looks at things that are visual. You can't just apply the same set of rhetorical rules to uh, pictures or photographs uh, that you would to a written speech. You know, that, that makes a certain amount of sense, even though arguably the same stuff kind of applies there. You know, logos, ethos, pathos, and, and so on uh, from Aristotle. But anyway, they, they, they do probably have some unique things about video games at least that's the case he's trying to make here and what makes I guess a video game rhetorical or what's sort of the unique rhetorical aspects of a video game as opposed to these photos or uh, movies or books or whatever speeches is that they have these uh, procedures and this possibility for playing around with those procedures right so it's you know you, you can get in there and do things again that even the designers didn't intend for you to be able to do and that does seem rather unique. Uh, you know, there are stories, various novels that always get brought up where you can, you know, choose your own adventure. <laughs> Actually talked to the guy who uh, created that series of, of books. Um, but, you know, those don't really get a, a lot of attention. And it's kind of questionable how game like that really is. But I think he is on to something here about, you know, let's really focus in on what makes these games unique. Instead of just talking about things that would apply to all media, like uh, if you just focus, for example, on the graphics in the stories, well, that's, you know, you could be, that same stuff would be in a book or a movie. You know, books and movies and games all, could all have stories and characters. You know, there's nothing unique about that aspect of video games. Uh, but if you get into the procedures, you know, now you got some interesting things to talk about that makes that game different uh, than, say, the movie Final Fantasy. Right, if you if you read the, if you play the game one of the Final Fantasy games, uh, that's quite a bit different than the movie Final Fantasy, uh, even though you got characters and story and the, the setting is the same and, and so on and so forth. Or same thing in this class with the Walking Dead game is a different experience than the Walking Dead comic, uh, even though it's uh, you know again set in the same universe for lack of a better word. All right, where does the rhetoric? kick in he says well some games we, we've already mentioned some of these are uh, based on reality like sim city or civ is supposed to be b loosely based on real human history uh, so you've got kind of arguments that are being made there like that library example i gave you or the tax example um but even if the game is not uh, based in those things it could still have these rhetorical implications to it even if it's a purely fantasy driven game uh, we might find all sorts of uh, uh, arguments being made there. And, of course, a lot of uh, feminist scholars have looked at things like uh, the Tomb Raider games, uh, the uh, Halo games. You know, you can get into, like, Cort let's talk about Cortana. You know? <laughs> what about Cortana? <laughs> you can have some pretty fascinating uh, scholarly discussions around that from using a feminist perspective uh, or any of the other perspectives we talked about. But, again, the, the goal is... Not just to think about Cortana as a, as, a, as a character like she would be in a movie, uh, but to really get into the procedures, you know, and, and sort of the game-like uh, elements and how that makes this a unique, a unique uh, rhetorical medium. Okay, get, he goes over a quick and dirty little history of rhetoric. You know, all the greatest hits, Plato, uh, Aristotle, good old Kenneth Burke. See, I told you Burke is just going to keep popping up everywhere. Uh, I like, you know, I, this would be a good, it's a good conclusion article for this course, because I like this. He, he's a very clear uh, recap of all these different rhetoricians. Yeah, Kenneth Burke is about identification instead of persuasion. You know, how do you identify, you identify with a character in a game, you, a lot of games let you create a character, you can make the character look like yourself if you like, or, or something different, uh, especially if you're playing an MMO like World of Warcraft, you kind of identify with that, that character <laughs> you're creating, right? Um, you know, the, sim the symbols or the graphics in that game, all the interfaces. So there is a lot, you know, I, I wish Kenneth Burke was alive. It'd be really fun to talk to him about video games in terms of these terministic screens and, and all of that. Okay, what else? <clears throat> Procedural rhetoric is a general name for the practice of authoring arguments through processes. So this is the real this is the real mead here 
that it got highlighted here that you'd want to use in a paper if you wanted to write about procedural rhetoric. So it entails persuasion to change opinion or action. Procedural rhetoric entails expression to convey ideas effectively, subdomain of procedural authorship. Its arguments are made not through the construction of words or images, but through the authorship of rules of behavior. The construction of dynamic models. So if you wanted to make an argument, you know, there's a McDonald's the game. <laughs> let's see, I think I got a question about this. Yeah, so let's go to this question here. I said, spend a few minutes playing McDonald's the video game. There, there's a link to it. I'll put that link in the question too. And then think about how that game is using procedures or rules. And how is it attempting to affect your beliefs, attitudes, or behaviors regarding the titular, I always look for an excuse to say titular, uh, corporation, McDonald's, uh, or perhaps some other broader issue affecting our culture. Maybe there's more than one. Uh, so have a look at that for a few minutes and then we'll come back and finish this up. Oh, yes, McDonald's. You know, every time I have uh, students play this game, I don't know what your experience was, was like. But, you know, a lot of people just say it's a fun game. <laughs> you know, they realize they're kind of being manipulated, <clears throat> you know, depending on how you feel about McDonald's. But uh, the game itself is actually pretty well made. You know, sometimes these things do backfire. And you end up having a lot more sympathy maybe for the CEOs of McDonald's or whatever the case may be than this uh, you know, these people might have intended. And you think always think about Paradise Lost and how people say, you know, the, the devil kind of comes out looking pretty good in that, you know. <laughs> uh, let's see. One use of procedural rhetoric is to expose and explain the hidden ways of thinking that often drive social, political, or cultural behavior. We often call such logics ideology, a term with a long and conflicted intellectual history. Yes, there's a game out that I played fairly recently called uh, Wasteland 3. And of course, a lot of people like the Bioshock, especially the one. What is it, Bioshock 2 or 3? One of them's got a lot of Americana um, images in there where there's, a, of course, the Fallout series. Uh, but a lot of those games kind of make arguments about uh, the United, United States and international relations and politics. You know, things of that sort. And they do kind of espouse this ideological view, you know, of, uh, <laughs> you know, all these, <laughs> just about all these game developers are coming out of California. You know, so, so you can guess where the politics are <laughs> in these games. <laughs> you know, they're in uh, San Francisco. Uh, but, you know, just because they intend it to be a certain way or they have a certain view, you know, I would argue if it's, if it's a well-done game, it doesn't, again, preach at you or force you into a narrow narrow model but you know actually would get you to thinking about these issues and uh, drawing some of your own conclusions so let, helping you to think rather than thinking for you <laughs> i guess would be my goal uh yeah so this uh, america's army game it's another great example this is 2002 uh, but this was it's really fascinating because you know the army has always had a problem like trying to recruit people into the army you know they they want like the best and brightest people, really good candidates to uh, to enlist you know, in the army. They, so they put all these TV commercials together and advertisements and you know posters, making it look like every minute it's going to be like jumping out of a helicopter, <laughs> you know, guns blazing or something. Uh, but you know, I guess that was a fairly effective. I, I don't really know, but they really kind of caught a tiger by the tail with this game. You know, so, so they put this game together with Unreal Two. You know, they had real game developers, and I know, I know some of these people that are not allowed to talk about it. <laughs> uh, but the success of this in getting people to sign up and list has just been, it's a game changer, pun not, not intended in that case, but it was really just amazing how well it worked. So it's, you know, just as, as a work of persuasion, you can't really argue with it, you know. It, it, it sort of hit the right market, uh, the right audience. I guess the, the sort of people that, you know, if you want to appeal to gamers and get them to enlist in the in the army, you know, making this video game was a, a smart move. 
Uh, but Bogos digs in a little bit into this game. Again, he's trying to apply that procedural rhetoric that we've been talking about. And he says it's really the game's political simulation is more interesting uh, than the mechanics and the physical simulation. He says, uh, what does he mean by that? Well, the game is not like Doom or any of these. You're not just running around shooting everything. Uh, it's the opposite of that. So like very strict army rules of engagement, ROE, is uh, built into the game. Like real stuff that happens, I guess, in boot camp. I haven't been to boot camp. Some of you probably <laughs> have been. You could you could uh, verify this for me. But uh, there's the Uniform Code of Military Justice, Rules of Engagement, lands, Laws of Land Warfare. And so there's basically all these rules that are based on real life, you know, army stuff. And if you break the rules in the game, you get instant consequences. And so in a way, it's kind of persuading you or kind of getting you to identify, I suppose, uh, the game with the real deal. Because uh, it has these real uh, rules. It's not just a fantasy, you know, shoot 'em up kind of game. It, ha it has the, the real life components in there. And then he gets into there about how you might even be able to start questioning the values of professional practices rather than just assume those values blindly. Uh, so maybe the people that make this game want you to have a very positive view, let's just say, uh, about all these things. But maybe the result might be, you know, as you're playing this and thinking about it, you know, you might come with, come up with different conclusions. <clears throat> yeah, then he talks about some of these games that he made to try to <laughs> get people to vote certain ways. <laughs> um, the player is not brainwashed or otherwise fooled into adopting the candidate's poli policy position. Right. Uh, and there's this bully example. I haven't played this one either, but... You know, I remember when people were talking about it, they thought it was like this, you know, the celebration of schoolyard harassment. When it, if you actually played the game, you found out it was, you know, quite different. That happens with a lot of games. You know, just, just looking at it superficially, you think, wow, what a terrible message that game has. You know, I, I don't want my kid playing that, uh, or I don't want to play that. You know, when you come to find out, if you just would spend some time with it, you'd find it's actually not, <laughs> you know, inculcating that stuff at all. You know, that happens a lot of media. I know a lot of people listen to music, and they will say this this particular artist or song gets vilified in the media, demonized all the time, when really it's a positive message if you would just listen to the actual lyrics, you know, instead of just, you know, going with what you hear in the rumor mill. <clears throat> all right, let's uh, wrap this up. When we play video games, we can interpret these arguments and consider their place in our lives. Playing video games is a kind of literacy. Not the literacy that helps us read books or write term papers, but the kind of literacy that helps make us critique the systems we live in. All right, thinking about all the procedures that regulate your life. There's a one of my favorite games in this context is called The Sims. Uh, and a lot of people look at that and they just say, well, that's just want, talk about wanton consumerism. I mean, my goodness, look, you're just buying things and trying to live this, you know, rich you know, middle class, upper class uh, lifestyle, everything's about stuff and commodities. And, and again, that's just, uh, you know, the way you play that game. You know, you could resist that. You could come walk away with the exact opposite uh, conclusion based on your own analysis of the rhetoric in there. It's not just, uh, you know, the, these brainwashing machines and everybody that plays uh, The Sims uh, becomes this mindless consumer. You know, I would argue that's probably the opposite. Of that yeah I like this too so the, even if you don't play the games your kids probably are if you have kids or around kids uh, so you might want to know about them just for that context again not just making these assumptions but actually you know play a little play a little bit of Animal Crossing or Minecraft or something and you might be surprised because there's a lot of creativity you know in those games See, rather, we need to play video games in order to understand the possibility spaces their rules create and then to explore those possibility spaces and accept, challenge, or reject them in our daily lives. So, yeah, very, very true. So just the same, uh, you, know, you can see why I wanted to include this as a rhetorical perspective because he's basically saying the same thing here about video games that Cell Now has been saying with all those different perspectives, right? We need to become aware of these things, how they work, how they operate, uh, maybe to resist or to accept it and challenge it, but we kind of have to know what it is first 
uh, which is the whole point of this. Okay, I'm about out of steam here, so let's call it. Uh, you know, as always, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. If you have questions, comments, observations, stories, whatever it is, love to hear from you. And I will see you. <laughs> well, I guess this is the last one. <laughs> so hopefully you'll take another class with me. Uh, if you like video games, take uh, English 280 when that's available. And we'll talk a lot more about BoGhost. Uh, but, you know, I hope you liked all the other perspectives as well. It's been lots of fun uh, making these. I really enjoyed it. And I love uh, all your comments. <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to get off of this before I start choking up. All right. Well, have a good day.